It's my pleasure to introduce Junwei Shi. She has the dubious distinction of being my first graduate student. He joined my lab in 2010 when we were a lab of two people, and I was one of those two people. <laughs> he very courageously uh, joined the group at that time, um, co-mentored by Bruce Stillman as well at that time. He's now the chair of his committee. Uh, Junwei has led a number of very successful projects. Um, he's published three first author papers. Um, He's prepared for you today a very nice lecture that I think captures um, the significance and the impact of one of his major projects, which was the discovery of a therapeutic strategy for leukemia um, that he discovered. And this is work that's now um, being tested in, clinic, in phase one clinical trial starting last year, the direct translation of the discoveries he made in the laboratory. Um, and so not only has he discovered something that has an application, but he's also, in the last few years, figured out the mechanism for why this approach even works in the first place. Um, and not to steal your thunder, but essentially it amounts to discovering a strategy to inactivate the C-MIC oncoprotein uh, pharmacologically. And so um, with that being said, Jun Wei. Well, um, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, we use RNA interference screen to identify novel drug target in a leukemia. So, so just very brief is that I mean we have a war that against a cancer that 40 years ago is because that there's actually the cancer is a one major cell death actually caused in a human. Um, till now in the in the 20th century we got about 500 million people die is because of cancer. And I show you this here, this, uh, uh, the time that uh, President Nixon, Nixon, Nixon signed the bill to against the cancer and also to cover for the New York Times that when we see the hope that we can win this war in 20 years ago and now we started talking about how we cure cancer. But back to these things is that it's based on the advantage we're learning more about what the cancer is and what's the molecular mechanism behind it. So today, I'm, I mean, there's a lot of numerous um, improvement in the cancer therapy, but I just want to show a few key points is that a milestone in this cancer therapy. So right after the World War I, and people noticed that when you use a synthetic chemical, can actually slow down the cancer cell proliferation. And until later on, uh, two physicians, um, Phil and Fisher, they actually realized that if you combine a, a, a selection of the, this chemical, you actually can cure a subgroup of the patient with a cancer. And I'm talking about cure is that once you erase this, they don't relapse again. But again, it's a very small subgroup of a patient, patient can actually re respond to this uh, chem combined chemotherapy. This is the first example that modern chemical can actually change the cancer disease. And with later on then, we noticed that the cancer cell actually can be driven by mutation of the genes, especially some oncogene mutation, they can driven this uh, un uncontrolled proliferation of a cancer. So people thinking about, wow, I mean, if we can have a drug, well, first we need to identify this uh, potent oncogene in some type of cancer. If we, have, we can have a drug to target this uh, mutate oncogene, whether we can actually slow down the disease. So this is a, and we call it oncogene target therapy. This is an example shows us a BCR able, a mutation of a kinase in a B cell leukemia. And if you can develop a small molecule probe that labeled red here, you can actually inhibit the, can, um, the cancer driven by this mutation. This molecule has been proved, and I think it's a 99, um, in the 1991 by FDA, uh, to treating this specific type of cancer can achieve 90% cure. They don't relapse. Um, no, say they relapse, but they use another one molecule actually fix the point mutation in this oncogene. They can actually, basically they can cure 90% of this form of cancer with this mutation. And, and more recently, I mean, it's even getting more exciting is that people raise the idea of uh, uh, immunotherapy of a cancer. And, Instead of uh, using chemical target the mutate oncogene, they think that, wow, why not we just use our own immune system to find against the cancer? So this is uh, a protein crystal structure of a protein uh, called uh, CTLA4. So this protein actually is controlled your immune system cell death. 
So if you have a molecule or a potent peptide, you inhibit this potent, you will, in, um, you will trigger your immune system to find the cancer. And actually, the drug that targets this potent has been FDA approved uh, by 2011 to treat it uh, against the metastasis, metastasis melanoma. It showed pretty response. So um, I think that this concept of treating cancer, uh, the modern way that, uh, by, based on our understanding of the molecular mechanism, has been advanced our uh, therapy method to actually deal with a cancer. But this is only the start. Um, because if we look back to these 40 years, um, we do get significant decreasing of the uh, death rate about the cancer patient. But we still have a lot of room, actually, we can improve this. And um, if you uh, look at the male, the, uh, the death rate in the male uh, is dropping down, it's because that the successful of the smoking seasons and then the prevention of a prostate cancer actually can achieve this. But overall, when we're talking about um, how can we actually find the cancer and we cure it, we still have a long way to go. Um, so a very brief introduction about what is cancer. Cancer actually is a genetic disease that with a gene mutation that within your own cell, they driven the normal cell to an uncontrolled cell growth state and then spreading and metabolizes in the cell. So it's because that the genetic mutation is just some, somehow can be random and if they happen to in some potent oncogene or some key genes that within the cell, they will driven the cancer. And also it's because this randomness, so you will get a population of a cancer cell that with a different kind of mutation. It's a, basically, if a cancer is not one disease, it's a summary of a key gene mutation and driven the disease. So it also makes the therapeutic as hard as because that if you consider a target therapy, you know one key oncogene. If you have a drug to target one oncogene, you might erase 90% or 99% of the cancer. But if you don't erase everything, they might still will come back later. It's because that they can involve with other potent oncogene. So the challenge with us is that we need to identify the key mutation and then if we want to erase it, we need to get one shot, erase everything. So uh, in Chris's lab, we are studying leukemia. It's a, it's a blood cancer actually by overproduction of a, a normal and immature blood, uh, white blood cell. So uh, this is a two uh, picture under the microscope taking the blood from a normal patient and a leukemia patient. So in blood system, they have a very precisely hierarchy order of all this kind of uh, population that they have their own function. The white blood cell is that they will find for the uh, infection and to, uh, I mean, it's provide the immune system. So majority of, uh, when you uh, take a picture of your blood, majority is a white blood cell like this uh, light pink color here. You will see a small population of a white blood cell. But when people have a leukemia, you will see this mass product, uh, production of this uh, immature white blood cell, basically is because they're immature and then they take over majority of the population, so they mess up the whole blood system. Is um, the same in the two uh, yes. Um, so, um, one thing is that, I mean, from a physician, I mean, I take a cold death from a book, The Empire of All uh, and Melody is that if you see a, uh, see a leukemia from the perspective of a physician, I mean, leukemia is a terrifying to experience and terrifying to observe and terrifying to treat. The body invaded by leukemia is pushed to its little physiological limit. Every system, heart, lung, lung blood, working as a knife edge of its performance. It's because, I mean, when people dis uh, find this leukemia specific, the one that we are working on, the disease progresses so fast. If you don't treat it, I mean, I mean, th this might crash your system in a, within days, uh, within a few days. Um, I mean, the most heartbreaking is that um, leukemia actually is a, a common, it's very common in children cancers. One third of the children cancer is a pediatric leukemia. And, but I mean, 
compared to adult leukemia, uh, actually um, uh, the colon therapy actually is, uh, works a lot better when in the children's. Um, so, but in the overall, um, the by not standard way that we cure leukemia is not very successful because um, by examining by NCI, so in, two, in 2014 we will get about uh, 50, 52,000 new cases of uh, leukemia in US and then about half of uh, the leukemia patients that diagnosis before will die in this year is because that a lot of times I actually uh, use the chemotherapy we can actually erase the disease pretty efficient about 70 percent but within five years 70 percent of this patient will relapse that um, I mean by traditional way that we don't have very successful to handle it. So as I mentioned that uh, they actually the BCR able uh, the potent oncogene is a one of the good example in leukemia. It takes about 20% of the leukemia patients. If you have this mutation, you can very successful with a clinic, a uh, clinic to actually cure this one. And then the other one with a PML uh, IR mutation, you also have, have another drug that can very successful control the disease. But I mean, around 70% of the leukemia we still don't have a very efficient way to handle it. And then within this 70% uh, of leukemia, we get of hundreds of uh, different kinds of uh, mutation that actually can driven the disease. At least uh, some of them here, um, they, they have more. Um, so today I'm gonna, add, I mean, talking about is that we want to find some uh, new target to against that this rest of leukemia. Um, not all of them, but we want to use as a proof of principle. So what we're talking about uh, finding a target is that usually the protein that can be designed by a chemical probe as a druggable protein, they usually have a surface structure like this as a pocket here, and then you can fit the chemical inside the pocket to inhibit this protein function. So, but a lot of times that, I mean, um, when people in, especially from the pharmaceutical company, when they consider a drug the protein, and without any biology knowledge, they think, okay, we got target kinase, because that's easy enough to find. I mean, they must have a pocket and they have a chemical reaction. But a lot of time that we know that the protein actually matter uh, in cancer, especially I'm showing two examples of a KRAS and MEG protein here, is they don't have much of uh, like this uh, deep pocket surface structure to fit a chemical probe to be targeted. And unfortunately, these two proteins mutation can actually sufficient drive more than 50% of every cancer. So as a I mean, potential drug target, I mean, these two proteins will be very obvious. We should target it. But because lack of the structure, we can't just fit a molecule in these proteins. Um, so, well, how can we identify new drug targets in leukemia? So to address this question, we need two things that we need to improve at. To, we need to use two different kinds of things combined together. First, we need to have a model. Actually, we can mimic the disease of leukemia in a human, but the one that we don't have a very good therapy of in the mouse, because we need a very easy tool to actually study in the academic lab. And then the second is that we need an other tool is that we want to find the target that actually matter and potentially can drug the ball by the small molecule. But without develop a molecule first, we know whether this target is workable to work on. So we use another tool is that use the RNA screening to find potential drug target. So I'm gonna give a, a very brief introduction about the genetic mouse model that we use. Uh, this mouse model is uh, developed by a Scott Lowe's lab. Um, so we first take the bone marrow cell, isolated the blood stem cell from the mice, and then we engineering with the mutation that and the oncogene that actually we find in the human patient to this mouse cell. And then we inject and transplant back to the, this bone marrow to the mouse. And a few days later, um, then this mouse will develop leukemia. When we isolate this cell, look at it under microscope. 
they look exactly like the disease sample that we can observe in a human patient. So this is the very good model. Actually, we can use to mimic the human disease, but we, instead we do it in the mouse to try to mimic the whole process. So and try to just modify the disease progression in a living mice. Uh, we engineering engineering the luciferase reporter into this mouse cell. So we basically can just look at the use of luciferase to look at monitor the disease progression uh, in the mouse um, to uh, as an in vivo imaging. I'm sorry. Oh, it's a luciferase. The luciferase gene. Um, so, and this is uh, one example is that it's an AML EDO uh, mutation. Um, this one is responds pretty uh, well with a standard chemotherapy. So, we take the, uh, the mice with uh, this mutation, and the untreated mice progress with leukemia. We use a combination chemo uh, chemotherapy, the mouse responds by looking at luciferase as an indication of uh, disease progression. And then we use another model, uh, it's called MAF9, uh, which is actually in the clinic, this one is uh, pretty resistant. They don't have a pretty, uh, good response with the um, standard chemotherapy. So we can see that the disease progress is actually more faster. Um, then they show very little uh, response to this standard chemotherapy. And then what we do is that we use this um, uh, chemo resistant uh, mouse model, we try to screen whether we can find target to slow down um, the disease, disease progression. So talking about a drug target, um, so traditionally when people are thinking about using a chemical probe to target a drug, but I mean we can't just have a screening library making all this chemical specific and selectivity target a bunch of uh, this potential target. We need an easy way to screen through the target. So instead, we're designing a chemical probe. We use a, take advantage of a technology called RNAi interference. Basically, is instead of targeting the pocket of the protein, we just target the po the, uh, the production of the protein itself. We make the protein disappear. So what the question we are all, I want to ask is that we have a, a bunch of a potential target in leukemia cell, and this target also in the normal cell and we design a pool of uh, SHRNA that can actually individual target each of this protein and we will ask, so if you have one SHRNA uh, can actually target one of this target, we cause the leukemia die but not much phenotype in the normal cell. Um, so what's the target we're looking at? We are what we actually in interesting with a one group of target is called epigenetic regulators. Epigenetic is the information that not encoding in your DNA sequence, but the protein and the chemical modification around it to control your gene expression. So um, just like your DNA sequence coding all your proteins within your hard drive in your computer. And the epigenetic is a software to execute this program. So we are not looking for if you get a mutation in your proton oncogene. We are not looking for to fix the mutation in your proton oncogene. Just like if the hard drive has some problem with, with it, we're not going to fix the hard drive. We write a program to bypass the requirement for that hard drive, or maybe just we write a program to find something to can rescue the, the mutation. So we're looking at this protein itself because they uh, characterize the chemical reaction in the DNA and the chemical reaction in the commenting in the higher level above the DNA. So they usually have a very uh, defined deep pocket structure. They might be feasible to uh, design a molecule to target it. So they're all potential drug target. So basically we want to do a screening um, in a mouse, I actually can look for this uh, epigenetic regulators. Potentially, can can be drugable. So the experiment, the experimental strategy is that we take the mouse model of a leukemia cell, we combine with the RNAi technology, and then we screen of a potential drug target. Um, here is a commenting regulators, 
uh, no, uh, epigenetic reg regulators. And then we find the normal targets actually will kill this leukemia cell. And then we verify and develop and test whether there's a drug that actually can inhibit these identified targets. And then we verify in the human leukemia patients uh, samples. So, and this, um, this is the, the data that we actually comes out from this uh, panel of a screening. Uh, we identify a protein of a named BRD4 in the screening um, as a normal target in leukemia. And in literature, actually there's no report error associated with BRD4 protein with a leukemia development. Here shows the uh, diagram is that the, the uh, inhibition uh, efficiency. The higher that means is that inhibition of the BRD4 cause growth uh, phenotype in the leukemia cell. And basically, it, the, we use a RNAi to target BRD4, it maps out the assay that we perform the screening. Um, so when we look at the cells, um, in the control one, this is a leukemia cell, it's a round and the nucleus is a very big, um, it's just like blast uh, shape. But when we inhibit BRD4 by RNAi, we see this cell growing a little bit bigger, the nuclear change the morphology, and then you see a little bit bubble, it's more like a normal white blood cell. So basically when we inhibit BRD4, we can actually push the cell differentiate to normal, and as I mentioned before, leukemia is a disease that with an immature of a white blood cell. And so we further verify that, well, this is a tissue culture play. So whether we can actually see the same thing when we look at in the mouse. So uh, we use this uh, chemo resistant mouse model, and then we initiate the disease in the mouse to a pretty similar level. And then this is a control, this is a BRD4 RNAi. And then when we inhibit BRD4, we can actually slow down the disease progression in the mouse. And this actually leads to the extent of the mouse survival. Um, well, as I consider that whether actually this is a leukemia specific target or is we hit more general normal cells. So we use this a BRD4 RNAi um, across a few cell lines. Um, so the, the color indicate that if it's a red, that means uh, the sensitivity of the cell to this BRD4 inhibition. So the heat map here shows that um, this is a two different type of a leukemia. Um, if we inhibit BRD4 in leukemia compared to melanoma, breast cancer, uh, pancreatic, and fibroblasts, they show specificity because looks like it's only leukemia is sensitive to this BRD4 inhibition. So a little bit brief introduction about what is a BRD4. BRD4 is a dual bone domain uh, containing protein and it has a two hormone domain uh, which will recognize the acetylated histone. It's a modification uh, in the histone that actually can control the gene expression. And then they have an ET and a CTD, CTM domain that involve in a various protein-protein interaction that actually control the transcription activation. And very luckily, the time that we finish the screening, we find a BRD4 as a, a potential novel target in leukemia. Uh, a chemist from uh, Dana Farber, Jay Brenner, uh, they find a molecule called JQ1 can actually selectively binding the bone domain pocket of the BRD4. And here's the crystal structure shows that the small molecule JQ1 can actually fit to the pocket of the Bowman domain, and this actually is a critical for the BRD4 function. So if you consider um, BRD4 is an activator, um, re it recognizes a modification on top of a histone, and then activate transcription, and when we add the JQ1, we block the uh, Bowman domain, we will release the BRD4 from the chromatin. So actually we can inhibit the transcription regulation. So Again, um, we want to know that while well, we have a molecule, whether we can actually repatriate that the phenotype we see from the RNAi interference in the mouse. So we initiate the disease in the mouse, and we also treat the molecule. And 
just consistent what we see from the BID4 RNAi in the mouse. Using the small molecule JQ1, we can actually slow down the disease progression. And it also extends the mouse survival. This is a survival curve. Um, look at the percentage of the mouse um, treated with a control uh, vehicle and then the JQ1. We can get about about six to seven days of extent, about six to seven days uh, of the mice. And to ask how general the um, leukemia actually responds to this um, uh, small molecule, JQ1, uh, we use another genetic uh, model uh, of a leukemia in the mice, and then we start the disease, and then we, add, we inject the mice with the JQ1, we can also slow down the disease progression. So it looks like that when we inhibit BRD4, it's not we only inhibit one specific genetic uh, subtype of leukemia. It's a little bit broader than from the original screening. And then we actually went ahead to test a different genetic background of a leukemia cell line, and including human and some of the patient sample. They show pretty good response to the JK1. Um, well, when people consider as a drug target, Yes, you can cure leukemia, but do you actually generate general toxicity in a normal cell, which is usually the traditional uh, standard chemotherapy, because they just uh, they can't distinguish your normal and your cancer cell. They just kill everything. So you generate a lot of side effect and toxicity. So when we extend the JQ1 treatment in the mice, uh, we don't see uh, this is a two uh, histogram that compare the vehicle and the JQ1. If you zoom in, uh, you, can't, you probably can't tell much differences between the JQ1 treatment mice and then the normal uh, the vehicle treatment mice. Um, the point that I want to say here is that when extend longer time of injecting the JQ1, it's not uh, hurting, harming your normal cell um, that much. And though the data I'm not showing here, uh, a month in, uh, injection of JQ1, it won't cause um, much change in the uh, bone marrow stem cell, and also they don't cause the weight loss of a mice. Pretty much is that the drug is very well tolerant in the mice and give us a window for treating leukemia. So just see how consistent with the RNAi and with this small molecule uh, and adding JQ1 to this leukemia cell, we also see the cell differentiate to a normal cell shape. Um, so getting a little bit more detail is that, well, I mean, it looks like BRD4 inhibition work, but why it work in leukemia therapy? So we want to know what's the mechanism. It can actually account this uh, therapeutic. So one thing actually get us very interesting is about, is I mentioned that MEK is a potent oncogene more than 50% of the cancers actually have a mutation of this gene. It's driven an uncontrolled growth of a cancer cell. If you can have a molecule target MIG, I mean, you can basically kill a lot of cancer. But however, because there's a lack of a structure, even people try a long time, they still consider this is an undruggable target. But as the things that are exciting us the most is that when we add the JQ1 to a time course, to look at what gene change in the leukemia, we find actually MIG is the most rapidly downregulated genes in leukemia. It looks like that when we inhibit BRD4 in leukemia, we actually are targeting the MIG gene. Though we don't have a molecule to inhibit the MIG protein, but it looks like we have a way to target the MIG in the leukemia without targeting the gene, the protein itself. So, um, this is a Western showing that if you look at the, the, half, uh, the left half, this is a MEK protein level. When we add the JQ1, we will see the protein disappear. The beta acting is a loading control with the sample. We, have a, we want to know that well, because MEK is uh, such a potent oncogene in leukemia, we wonder, is that the effect that we see this uh, BRD4 inhibition in leukemia is basically what the phenotype we see from the MEK inhibition? So we find a way to overexpress the MEG, which is no longer responds to the JQ1. Even we're adding JQ1, the MEG protein is still there. So we wonder whether we actually can prevent the JQ1 inhibition phenotype. So I just show you an example is that 
Uh, in addition, a lot uh, morphology change and the transcription phenotype. When we're adding JQ1, we can force the differentiation of the leukemia cell to a white blood cell shape. But when we overexpress the MEG, we basically can block this differentiation, indicate that, that the phenotype we see from the BRD4 inhibition in leukemia is very likely that come from the MEG inhibition. Uh, we actually try to do more analyze on this. We find that 90% of the uh, genome uh, transcription change actually is come from the MEG inhibition from, by this small molecule. So when we look at, well, I mean, as I show a slide of the heat map, say, this BRD4 inhibition so, shows very severe phenotype in leukemia cell, but not in the melanoma, breast cancer, fibroblast cell. So we wonder whether actually this MEG expression change in response to this small molecule also shows the same pattern. So if you look at the Western here, look at the MEG protein level, in two different kinds of leukemia, we see MEG change when we add the JQ1. But not the melanoma, and other, uh, fibroblast and other cancer cells. It looks like that this BRD4 inhibition control MEG expression can actually account this sensitivity of the cancer cell line. But why? I mean, why BRD4 matter in leukemia but not in other cell type? Because we are looking for something that they both exist in every cell type. So it turns out that when we look at the level, I mean the BRD4 in the genome, we find that actually BRD4 occupy in a very distinguished island that downstream of a MEG it's about 1.7 megabase down, uh, downstream. And this localiza uh, localization of a BRD4 is not in other cell line that they are resistant to the chemical. It's also not in the normal cell line. And it looks like somehow this, uh, this um, profound BRD4 occupancy in this MEG gene in leukemia generate its sensitivity. And more provocative is that, I mean, this region actually is a is a amplifier uh, in leukemia patients. Indicate that um, the element in this region might be very critical for leukemia. And then somehow that when we use a JQ1 and inhibit BRD4, we influence this element, and then we trigger the makedown regulation. So it's just a very very quick summary about the mo working model that we're thinking about using JQ1, targeting BRD4, and MEG transcription, is we find in a 1.7 megabase downstream, we find some leukemia-specific uh, enhancer. And then this enhancer is with a bunch of a factor binding there. And this enhancer is actually looping to the MEG promoter gene to control its expression. And this requires BRD4 binding there. And when we use a small molecule to target the Bowman domain of a BRD4, we displace BRD4 from the commutin, and then we, info, we shut off the MEG transcription. So by the time that we have um, we published our paper, uh, indicate that BRD4 is a therapeutic target in leukemia, and two different groups, uh, one's from uh, Tony Kusredi, uh, he also published a paper side by side, and then a lab, um, a pharmaceutical company, Constellation, also observed the similar things, and this uh, this study is actually uh, have been reproduced by several other labs. Just highlight that I mean, if people are talking about that the lack of a reproducibility of the uh, research, and this serves as an example that I mean, it can be very uh, very well validated, and. Um, I also have a list that of the ongoing uh, uh, study that indicate that when using this uh, JQ1 inhibit BRD4, they can actually target and make extend to other incurable cancer. And this list has been uh, keep going. Um, there's I just want to show one example I take from this list is that in a lung cancer, um, a KRAS mutation. Uh, we've driven uh, the pro progression of a cancer uh, as a pretreatment that you will see uh, the lung cancer here. Uh, when single injection of a JQ1 for two weeks, you will see the regression of a cancer. 
And the statistic is that almost every uh, cancer in this mouse model has a pretty good response. Um, two years uh, after that, the first initial publication, um, there's uh, actually five uh, different kinds of clinical trial carried about uh, by different co pharmaceutical company. They try to use this uh, BID4 inhibitor um, in leukemia in some subtype of um, cancers. Um, Actually, last time when I was uh, in a pharmaceutical company meeting, uh, not meeting, a conference, and as far as I heard that almost every company have their own program, try to de uh, develop their own molecule to target this BID4. And this certainly become a very um, growing, uh, th this area will become uh, rapidly going up. Um, we are actually very looking forward to see how this come uh, as a translational. Um, so just as a summary, um, is that we use this uh, mouse model to mimic uh, human leukemia. We combine the RNAi technology. We survey uh, epi ep epigenetic regulators, and we find uh, BID4 as a novel target in leukemia. Um, we use a small molecule to target BID4, can inhibit leukemia prolifer growth in the mouse, and then we can extend this to the human leukemia. Uh, what more we can actually do is that we use the same strategy. We identify more targets. Um, here I just list a couple, uh, like BRC, uh, PRC2, BRG1, and RF20. The time that actually when we find that the PRC2 uh, is a ta potential target in leukemia, there's no uh, chemical probe actually is available. But uh, recently there's a successful develop a small molecule to target the, the PRC2. So um, this actually can also verify that the, this small molecule efficiency in a leukemia cell. And so far, and I don't know any molecule and of a BRG1 and RF20 uh, exists, but um, we can use this tool to um, evaluate and this target. It will be actually really interesting to see if we can, someone from the chemist on the pharmacological pharma company to develop a molecule to target this uh, potential hits and targets in leukemia. And this concept to identify the targets uh, in leukemia, I think that actually can extend to other kinds of cancer. And um, we're talking about something is that we're looking for the potential drug targets. We don't need this drug target to be a potent oncogene to mutate it. We just need to find things that we generate a dependency in these cancer cells and in contrast to other cells. So we will serve as uh, things that even like MIG, we know that it's a very good potential drug target in every cancer, but we're just not good at targeting it. But we can have another way to look at targeting it is because we can look at the potential can be druggable targets, whether we can bypass the MIG but still control this uh, potent oncogene expression. So um, to summarize that uh, the other I, um, potential uh, implication is that we can actually attack these uh, undruggable proteins by turn off the expression uh, through controlling the epigenetic, not the gene themselves. Um, sorry, and yeah, so it's this uh, drugable epigenetic regulators. And with that, I would like to have my acknowledgement slide and would like to thank my advisor, Chris, and all his lab people. And we also very fortunately have a lot of collaborators. Um, Jay Brenner from Dela Farber that provide us uh, with a JQ1. And we use the model developed in Scott Slow's lab in the snow catering. And though some of the data I don't sh haven't shown it here, we also collaborate with uh, David Spector in Cosmic Harbor, Michael Wigler, try to understanding the mechanism of the BID4. And we collaborate with uh, uh, Rick, uh, Rick Young from MIT to look at the, the genome profile of the BID4 occupancy. And we collaborate with, uh, uh, actually, we work together uh, with uh, uh, Honus and to study to. Build up, he built up the mouse model and then we study the dependency and then we study the detail mechanism. 
And also I want to thank my committee member, Ed Liu, uh, Chris Hamill, David Spector, and Bruce Stillman. Um, with that, I would like to take questions.